Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. I got a little more room to breathe than I did last week. Um, I wish I could tell you about the work stuff that that ate me alive because, well, it's about how we're going to vaccinate the world population. But that's about as much as I can tell you without blowing up a lot of NDAs and house rules and stuff like that. Suffice to say, it's uh, it's a little stressful, but in easier to relate news, um, Amy and I went back up to Storm King, the big sculpture center in New York State on, on Sunday. It was cold up there, but um, we had a good time. We we wandered around the grounds the third time we've been uh, starting last September. And we got to see the sculptures and the art in um, in different light. There was no snow on the ground, really, uh, which would have changed a lot of the cast for some of this stuff. But but it was still pretty, uh, pretty neat. And we got to a- approach things deliberately from different angles, um, which opens up the art in different ways. It's sort of the nature of sculpture, especially stuff that's built into to some of these big areas of the, the grounds. There was almost no one there when we arrived. I'm, you know, perpetually, you have to book it in advance. And we booked the earliest spot, which is 10 a.m. And Amy said she sort of expected to see like zombies come trundling over the ridge at one point because, um, well, it was that sort of vibe. No one around and uh, and and just this weird potential sense of menace, I guess. But anyway, I took along my sketch pad and some pencils, figuring I'd work on that uh, daffy drawing practice I've fallen into this last month or two. And I I tried drawing the big thing you see when you come into the South parking lot, which is Mark DeSevera's giant E equals MC squared sculpture. And it's all long girders and a disc and, and more girders and a lot of straight lines. And I rapidly figured out that I can't draw a straight line, um, partly because it's a, a little tiny pad. Um, I was standing around in the cold. I just don't have a good hand. And um, that meant that I was not going to draw a lot of the sculptural type sculptures. And instead, you know, I drew more trees because, you know, that's my thing. I did get some good sculpture drawings in, um, well, good. Okay, I guess. Uh, the three-legged Buddha and uh, the eyes sculpture by Louise Bourgeois I did at the very end. And um, I posted those on Instagram. There'll be a link to that in the, the weekly email for this one. But but at one point, um, Amy suggested I, I take a picture of one tree and try drawing it at home because I just, we didn't have time and, and the angle we were at wasn't right. And and it was weird because that's, that's when it hit me that... I'm not interested in doing that. I'm I'm less interested in getting the drawings quote unquote right than I am in capturing that moment. Like like it's not the tree, but my seeing it and trying to get my hand to do things right that that matters or or the sculpture, whatever it is. Like drawing the feet of the the three-legged Buddha it made me see something I hadn't noticed on my previous visits about the foot or each of the feet and and something on them and and it made me realize why the sculptor made them the way they are and maybe i'd have gotten that from looking at a picture after the fact on screen but but somehow it feels more real this way now the flip side of that is um i draw quickly and in the moment and while that's spontaneous and great it also means I don't have any pressure to actually work on my drawings and and get better at them the way you would by well, by doing the work. This is a corollary. And keep in mind, this is all theoretical. This is just how can Gil figure out ways to undermine himself? So this is sort of like the Gil Roth undermining technique of not actually working too hard on my writing and, and really putting it out there, lest it turn out that, you know, at bottom, I'm <laughs> just not a very good writer. Uh, so this way, if I sort of do this instead of, of my art, um, maybe you won't catch on, I guess. So that means I'm going to draw what's in front of me and try not to overwork it, even though the work is 
is where you do the learning. Still, I am I am drawing some interesting trees and I'm figuring out interesting things to do on the fly. Like the way I approach the eyes sculpture was something I was happy with in terms of looking at something, breaking it down and, and trying to figure out how you would render it. I didn't do a great rendering, but the process of figuring it out is, is something. But I'm a mess. Um, so I'm making something I, I sort of enjoy. So so hey. Now, this week's guest, because we always need a segue, is pretty much the opposite of all of my undermining this. Uh, she is someone who stuck with her craft until she became one of the most distinct writing voices around. Uh, she's Vivian Gornick, and Vivian has a new collection out today from Verso Press, Taking a Long Look, Essays on Culture, Literature, and Feminism in Our Time. So this one collects uh, work from a, a span of more than 40 years of Vivian's career. and It really helps stake her claim as though she needs it at this point as, as one of the great literary essayists of our era. Now, I had read Vivian's work occasionally over the years in the New York Review of Books and Book Forum, and, and sometimes links would pop up like the Boston Review and places like that. But I'd never read her book length work until last year. And that is something I am now tremendously embarrassed by. Um, see, when I was recording with Benjamin Taylor last summer, he mentioned how long walks with Vivian had helped keep him sane during the pandemic and, and what a great talker she is and what a legendary writer and, and somebody who just knows New York inside and out. And, and that got me started looking at her, her work. And then Philip Lopate mentioned her, her great short book, The Situation in the Story in our show last November. And that really got me going. I just started picking up her books and just devouring them in a day or two. I mean, I can't believe I did not read her memoir, Fierce Attachments, decades ago, but at least I got around to it now. I was also thrilled that her, her most recent full-length book in 2020, Unfinished Business, tackles one of my favorite topics, which is what it means to reread a book. And I love that one, but honestly, I, I can talk up every one of Vivian's books that I've read in the past few months, right up through taking a long look. Uh, so when I saw she had this this new collection coming out, I harassed Philip into connecting us, and uh, and here we are. Now, what I want to say about taking a long look is it's not just a career retrospective. I mean, while it offers a glimpse into Vivian's development as a critic, which you can sort of see when you, you look at some of the pieces chronologically, it also shows how critical opinion shifts over the years and how certain books and authors can come into or, or out of favor. I mean, it'll sound sacrilegious coming from me, but I find myself wrestling with my opinions on Philip Roth after reading her 1970s take on him. And, and we get into that a little in the conversation. Now, the book also collects some of Vivian's essays on feminism from the 1970s, and those are just absolutely fascinating to me. Um, they're firmly in the, the second wave of feminism, and, and that's before the era I became aware of, of this sort of stuff in, in college. And at that point, which is late 80s and early 90s, theory with a, a capital T had sort of moved in and, and, and drove some pretty extreme views. Now, these pieces in, in taking a long look evoke evoke what that time was like for women. And as I point out in our talk, middle class white women, um, but they do it in a way that that can show contemporary people that the world they inherited, you know, had to be built. Anyway, I enjoyed taking a long look for both its literary and its its social visions. And of course, for, for Vivian's voice, she is a treasure. So check this one out. But also make sure you go back and, and read her memoirs and her collections and, and just be glad that we have a writer like this. Now, here's Vivian's bio. Vivian Gornick is a writer and critic whose work has received two National Book Critics Circle Award nominations and been collected in the Best American Essays 2014. Growing up in the Bronx amongst communists and socialists, Gornick became a legendary writer for The Village Voice, chronicling the emergence of the feminist movement in the 1970s. Her works include the memoirs Fierce Attachments, ranked the best memoir of the last 50 years by The New York Times, and The Odd Woman and the City, and Unfinished Business, Notes of a Chronic Rereader, as well as the classic text on writing The Situation and the Story. 
And now, the virtual memories conversation with Vivian Gornick. Tell me, with with taking a long look, the act of like revisiting and selecting the essays for this, what was it like for you in terms of, you know, looking back at your, your past work and, you know, ordering them from, from newest to oldest and what you saw in, in your own past writing? Oh, well, that's easy and it's not very d- deep. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'll, I have other good ones, but go on. <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I selected everything that I thought still held up, things that I thought, uh, that I still thought were well written enough and, uh, and, t- and smart enough and uh, sounded good enough. There were many things that I wrote at the same time as the pieces that were selected that I tossed. Because for all the reasons I've just said, because I felt that they they didn't stand up, and we chose, uh, I chose mainly, but I worked with my editor at Verso um, on this. Uh, actually, it was her name is Jessie Kindig, and she's a mo- wonderful, wonderful editor. And uh, it was because of her that the book was put together in the first place. It was her idea, and uh, she was doing it with me. And mostly we, when we agreed on a piece, it certainly went in. Um, and if we didn't, then, then we, we struggled through on it. Um, uh, but, but mostly that was the criterion. How, how good does it still sound? Um, <laughs> and what, what characterizes that? You know, what, oh. what, you know what, what do you feel doesn't work? You know, what, what were the sorts of things, not necessarily the content, but, you know, what told you this this doesn't need to be collected? Mostly if the thinking yeah. is sloppy, if the thinking doesn't justify itself, um, that is the biggest shock in reading your own stuff, it, it, for me, at any rate. Especially for me because uh, I am a writer who developed around the – not the theory, but the um, the practice of lucid, simple, compact is you know distilled more than anything else. I am a writer who's it turned turned out to be somewhat of a minimalist, something um, the the ex- absolute opposite of um, large sentences, paragraphs. Take your time; uh, you'll get there. I'm the exact opposite. Therefore, every sentence has to count with me. And um, every sentence has to count and every sentence has to forward and enlarge the thought uh, that you're aiming, that you're aiming to, uh, to enlarge upon. Um, And if it didn't, and that's been the biggest shock for me Mm. over 40 years of writing to write a piece that sounded perfectly done you know that it, that sounded perfectly argued in my mind in my mind, and then look at it again, either a few days later or a few months or a few years, and see, oh my God, it, it's there's so much missing here, or there's so much confused. Um, that has never stops amazing me. Never. Um, I'm sure every writer in the world knows what that what that means. Uh, you look at it, uh, you, you think it's fine, you've done the job, and you come back and a lot, well, I found many things that were published uh, in that, in that, in that uh, category, um, mm-hmm. because there were many editors who, were, who, were, who should have been smarter and better at it than me and weren't. Um, I was going to say, in your position, at least you could throw the editor under the bus and say they should have caught this. Well, so, <laughs> yeah, I could, but, <laughs> but where does yeah. that leave me? <laughs> when yeah, you mentioned being being surprised at, you know, at, at discovering your, your minimalist, you know, tone, Failures, is yeah. it, were you... You know, what sort of writing appealed to you? You know, was it more of a maximalist thing? Was it, you know, in, in that respect, was it more of a surprise to find yourself, oh, you know, absolutely. in that, that compression? Yeah. 
Absolutely. Totally. I mean, I grew up thinking I was going to write not only the great American novel, but rich, extravagant prose. There would be lots of it. As I've said many times before, it was Natalia Ginsberg who taught me who I was and what I had to live with, um, because this is her discovery. And she wrote one of the great pieces on, on how, how I became a writer um, on, called My Vocation. And in that, she describes exactly what I'm talking about as, as a, a lot better. Um, as a young woman, she imagined herself writing big, gorgeous, um, operatic prose. She loved that as a, as a kid, as any Italian writer would, would imagine themselves. Mm-hmm. And slowly, bit by bit, she discovered otherwise. And she discovered exactly what I'm talking about, you know, that she was indeed a minimalist uh, and that every sentence had to count. Um, and as she wrote, I began to see myself. I began to see what I actually was becoming. Um, and, and for many, many years, um, I felt myself a negligible writer because I couldn't write big. And in fact, there were many people over the years, not many, but some who mattered, who used to say to me on occasion, are you still writing those short pieces? (laughs) And I knew, knew, I knew what kind of a criticism that was. Uh, now suddenly I'm an old lady and it is all added up. I haven't, (laughs) (laughs) it's good. I stayed alive (laughs) this long, um, because that's the writer that I was. I mean, indeed it had to add up and, um, and that has been, um, well, I don't know what to say since, since that's the way things were, let's get back to this book since that's the way things were. It was in, it was really uh, incumbent upon me to choose those pieces that really worked, that you know, that really arrived, that really said what it had to say fully, and couldn't be faulted for being skimpy. Yeah. Uh, so that's more or less how the pieces were chosen. Yeah, I, then, I think of it as. Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. Yeah, it's all right. Well, th- then the question was, how do you arrange them? And I did want to arrange them from the most recent to the most distant, precisely because I wanted, I didn't want the reader, if anybody was going to read this book, as I think people do, from straight through from front to back, uh, I wanted them to not have to suffer through the, the least of it. I want, <laughs> wanted them to have the best of it. So quickly make up their minds. So that's why it starts with the most recent and it goes back to uh, the work I did uh, in 30, 40 years, 40 years ago at the Village Voice. Mm-hmm. Then- yeah, I, I, the, I was going to say that the Natalia Ginsburg chapter in your previous book, An Unfinished Business, by the way, yes. just just floored me. I, I you know, oh. Thanks for bringing that up because it's it's. Well, that whole yeah. book I, I adored. Uh, honestly, the original idea for the podcast uh, got almost 10 years ago was the notion of revisiting books, you know, what Ah. books, in this case, it was going to be, what books did you hate when you were younger? Not something you were assigned in school because we all had those, but what did you hate when you were younger that you grew into as, as you got older? What books got better for you over over the years? I couldn't find enough people who could answer that effectively that I turned this into a general interest conversation podcast, Ah. but, but yeah, reading unfinished business, I was like, oh my God, this is exactly, you know, this act of revisiting. Yeah. Oh, that's good to hear. When you and, can try it, you well, can the joke is, it. yeah, literally the only book from Unfinished Business that I had actually read, because I, I've read a million things, but I have all these incredible lacunae, a lot of them revolving around women writers because I'm a terrible person, uh, was J.L. <laughs> Carr's, and, and I'll bring that up again and again, uh, J.L. Carr's A Month in the Country. I'm like, wow. It took this long to come across something I've actually read. And all of, everything she's described sounds amazing so far. And I've got a bunch of them on oh. my shelf. So I, I'm, you know, you're, oh, you're inspiring oh. me to get out of my comfort zone. Oh, how interesting. The... But Car- A Month in the Country was the book you had read. Yeah, which oh. is obscure. One of the more obscure ones you, you mentioned yeah. through this whole yeah. thing. But I'm like, yeah. I've already read that twice. I'm rereading it now yeah. and just luxuriating in it thinking, yeah. Yeah, let me let me ease back into this, but you have so many others that I, I want to get to. Oh, that's good, good. You know. That's good to hear. 
but yeah, that's that, it, that, it, that book is really a, a little masterpiece. That book is really marvelous. It has a special place in my heart yeah. <laughs> too. Yeah. Now, when you talk about the um, again, what stands up and, and what doesn't. Are there literary opinions you've revised over the years, much like with Unfinished Business, with with taking a long look? Are there things you look back at and say, you know, maybe I, I was either too charitable or too unfair to this writer or, or that writer? Or do you feel, you know, your literary opinions of the time pretty much hold up? Uh, most of them, most of them do uh, because... There, most of the of the opinions that don't hold up are the opinions of that you hold of books that are being published at the moment. Yeah, you know what I mean. For instance, w a book that I raved about when I was young was uh, Lillian Hellman's um, memoirs. Uh, not a mm -hmm. book, a number of books. An Unfinished yeah. Woman, I think. When I was a kid, I adored those books, and I wrote about. I mean, I wasn't that young. I was at the Village Voice. It was the nineteen seventies. And I wrote about those books in glowing terms. And then I read them again, and I was miserable at what I had said because I didn't believe any of it anymore. Uh, that, that's a rare experience, rare experience. Uh, I'm sh over books that I review, I'm sure if I went back and reread at books that I've reviewed, I'm sure there'd be many that I would feel very differently about. Um, yeah, that... that that is a that's that's a miserable experience when that <laughs> happens. <laughs> yeah. I do have to admit, cringing inwardly over Philip Roth, who I I know I can't defend. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> which which is also how I connected with Benjamin Taylor, which is what led me to to you know yeah. conversing with you. But I was like, yeah, you yeah, no, she's completely accurate with these things you know I, I i my life of of you know reading roth i understand you know is um a limited viewpoint we'll, we'll put it that way so did you bring yeah. that up with ben no i mean we talked about roth roth was my white whale uh who i'd, I'd hoped oh, to really? record with and i'd never even got close until two weeks before he died when i finally got a connection who told me he's not well so oh. we're not gonna pursue this gil and then two weeks later he, he was gone was um but yeah that was a a you know reading you on roth in taking a long look and then you're you're later writing about him i'm like yeah yeah <laughs> it, it's it's a question uh, a writer and i had as to certain writers who will and won't survive you know uh. into the next couple of decades and this writer yeah. mentioned Roth. He also mentioned Lolita. He's like, I, I, as beautifully written a book as it is, I don't see how that survives another another generation. Oh, really? In, in terms White. of, you know, yeah, everything White. that's carried with it. It's just I guess the, because the, of political correctness or because it's not yeah. substantial? Oh, oh no, the, the art itself is, is, you know, should be immortal. But oh, uh, yeah. It's oh, the correctness. definition of the most, yeah, the the most yeah. problematic book. You know, oh, of, yeah, of it. absolutely. Yeah. I'm amazed it's not being burned, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. And Roth, why do you think Roth won't survive? That was this writer's contention, and he, he feels it largely because of, um, oh, again. Oh, because, uh, again, misogyny? Yeah, just the oh. women as... Oh, not okay. exactly human. And... Well, those are the worst reasons why uh, he, 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 anybody won't survive. If it's yeah. political correctness, that will be really sad. If it's that um, the depth uh, and breadth of them seem much shallower than they once did. Uh, th then that's that's okay. You yeah, know no, he I mean? was he was standing up for Roth as an artist, but he felt you know. Oh, he felt he would come under the uh, gun as yeah. a socially a social pariah. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. Well, Which, yeah, that may yeah. be true too. Yeah, that's yeah. too bad. I'm a, I'm certainly against that. I mean, right. um, political correctness is the bane of our existence. Um, so I, 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 yeah. I went to Hampshire College in the late '80s and early '90s. So everything that's going on now, I'm like, yeah, yeah. this this is what i experienced back then and it was problematic oh, really? then so you know it's 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 magnified now because of the media the internet etc but i'm like yeah we we ran into a lot of the same issues you know oh, it really? was what you can yeah, well, and, yeah. yeah what you can and can't do yeah 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 
But let me ask, you know, with the the later essays, which are the earliest ones from the from reprinting things from your 1970s uh, feminist collection of essays, how do you feel they hold up in particular in terms of where feminism is now, what those essays were were capturing then, you know? Looking well, back at those in particular, what do they, they mean for you? They are like, um, they are like um, us yelling, the British are coming. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they stay, they, for me, per, uh, personally, I fought against having them in the book because I find them very badly written. Uh, I, I, I keep fighting against all the stuff I wrote in the 70s that other people want to see back in print. Um, the, the communists and uh, stuff like that. And I feel the same way about uh, uh, these, all these pieces. However, the thought in them is not, not only is it not dated, um, I think every one of them says something important. Every one of them is, I mean, you, young women today could read those pieces the way I read Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1975 or 80. Um, they are too rhetorical. They would not be written today um, uh, as as they were then. And they're full of quirks and uh, stylistic uh, jerkiness. And it's full of stuff like beyond any question, beyond any doubt, or there yeah. can be no question that. And it goes on and on mm-hmm. like that. There's an awful lot of that, uh, which which mars and scars these pieces. But what I am actually looking at is it is um, it's worth reading again, just as a young woman could read who doesn't know any of the history of it. This would be a marker in the history. I mean, these pieces are uh, here. We were blind, you know, and we're just going blind through poking our way through the darkness into the light. And that's what these pieces. That's what my pieces read but like and that of everybody else who has become historically important. We are now, indeed, the second wave. We are the history. Um, young people today have a lot less his- historical sense and a lot less um, political sense than we had then. But many don't. You know, m- Maybe actually, even as I say that, it's not true. Uh, but it seemed to me that, you know, certainly the, the Me Too movement, uh, you know, which came yeah. roaring through uh, so unexpected and from God knows where um, with many, many of the people of the, of the, of the 2017 um, declarations, you felt they didn't have any real politics behind them. They were just, these were just declarations of, um, you know, of pure of grievance. Pure oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and delivered in a tone of outrage that was also tinged with disbelief. Like they had no sense of the history of what that we'd said, everything they'd said 40 years ago, mm-hmm. they weren't, they were not uh, building on what we said, which was fine. Uh, you know, it was a, once again, original discovery, reinventing the wheel out of honest passion and, um, and, and honest, and honest amazement that this sort of behavior and this sort of, um, agreement that men shall be dominant and women subordinate, that it still prevailed, that there was still so much of it. Uh, so I, I hope that, that um, many of them will read what I wrote all those years ago uh, and say to themselves, oh, my goodness, so this is the way it's always been. And they go back even further, just as we did. I mean, I take a, the writings of the second wave as having made – uh, a place on the historical line of um, of struggles for women's rights that you know bursts through the darkness and the silence every fifty years since yeah, that, that the, brilliant the French exception. Revolution. Yeah. Yes, that brilliant yeah. exception of mm-hmm. since the French Revolution. Um, so I, I mean, I'm proud to be part of a generation that will le- that has left behind. Uh, stuff that's valuable in this way, you know, that, that we, we put our two cents in and that um, people can look at it and see, oh, so that's the way it was in 1970. Um, so in that sense, I'm historically glad that, um, that these pieces are included here. Mm-hmm. 
we'll leave it at that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let me ask about that, that brilliant exception concept. Yeah. You bring it up in the piece on the, the second sex at 50. Yeah. And it's that notion that, you know, about every 50 years, there were these women who yeah. wanted more, needed more, were constrained by their times and basically blew them up. And I wonder, does, does that concept hold up uh, not hold up but is it does it even pertain nowadays or do you feel that you know enough has changed that there isn't you know the, the exception is is now the rule in a sense that, that well, women in a way in don't a feel way. as constrained yeah with all the misery more more i mean we made more of a revolution than any generation before us the, the i think to the largest extent the brilliant exception does not apply anymore mm-hmm. um because you know, when the brilliant exception was in use, there were no lawyers, doctors, uh, telephone right. lines, women, um, minors, um, uh, you know, they, they were just like nothing, a handful. And now that is absolutely true. For the middle class, for the educated middle class woman, life is incomparably more open and available uh, than it ever was before. Uh so it's true. It's interesting you point out, bring up the brilliant exception, which prevailed for, you know, centuries. Yeah. Um, I remember I used to think uh, in, I remember what once, um, not once, more than once, uh, in the 1970s, I, along with others, was interviewed, would often be interviewed by some European woman journalist. And she would say to me, why are you all complaining? Look, I have this job, blah, blah, blah. And I would patiently have to explain to her that she was the brilliant exception in her country. (laughs) And I said, France in particular does not value equality between men and women. In fact, France has such an insane worship of intellectual ability. If a monkey could read Sanskrit, it could become prime minister in your country. <laughs> when I think back on, on, on all that, but I was really true. It wasn't, it, w- women did not, who achieved stuff in France, for instance, they did so because they definitely were the brilliant exception. Yeah. And now, you know, I was in France about two years ago uh, um, promoting unfinished business. And the number of young women in publishing was really gratifying, just gratifying mm-hmm. to me. They were everywhere and they were so competent. But, you know, the amount of sexism that still existed <laughs> was so shocking. <laughs> but all of these women, they all complained about not being in the proper slot. You know, they were doing the yeah. work. But they but still the career did, track. Yeah. Did not, yeah. Yes, thank yeah. you. They still did not have um, either the money uh, that they should have had or the future that they should have had. Um, should have. Uh, whereas that would be fought. The, those particular women would not be saying this in the United States. Um, yeah. Here, those women pretty much can get what they what they need and the what they want, and they they arrive at the right places and with the yeah. right. Um, I'll I'll tell you in my day job I run a uh, a trade association nonprofit in the pharmaceutical sector. It's a weird thing. Don't ask how I ended up because it's a long long story. But when <laughs> I had to put the first board of of trustees together, it was twelve people and only three of them were women. And I apologize to all three. I'm like I'm sorry. You know I, I kind of thought there'd be more representation, and all three of them said, "Gil, that's two more women than any board we've ever served on." So you're uh, doing better than a lot of other places. I'm like, oh. now I feel worse somehow. <laughs> I, I feel bad on behalf of the, the whole gender and, and patriarchy. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a weird trip, but it's just the yeah. you know you try even with this this podcast I. Every year, I look at the male to female ratio of guests, and it's always out of balance pretty badly. And I realize I, I kind of have to actively do more and and you know make sure I'm not 
just seeing things through this guy, you know, lens, I, I guess. But, yeah. Well, how do you choose your subjects? Just people whose names appeal to you? Yeah, or? it's it's a cascade effect. You know, sometimes it's, like I said, you know, Benjamin and then Philip uh, both mentioning you. And I thought, oh, that's somebody I really need to sit down with. Sometimes publishers send me stuff. But even then, like there's a, a an unconscious bias I discovered. I'm like, I keep pushing towards white males and I need to actively not do that because I want to, every one of these conversations, yeah. I just, I want to learn. It, it's a line that Philip right. actually, if a uh, Lope connect collected of yours in that, that big collection, uh, I would wander for the rest of my life in the purgatory of self exile, always looking for the right person to talk to, which I know yeah. is a different context than what we're talking about, but yeah, I'm hunting for, for good conversation. And I, Every so often I have to step back and realize I'm falling into, you know, the self-selecting bias and I need to, to, you know, expose myself to a lot more points of view. So yeah, well, it's, it's, it's luck. always that challenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm doing my best. I'm actually in a run where it's a, a whole series of, of women in a row, basically, which I, oh, good. I know it's going to look weird one way or the other. It'll look like I'm pushing one side and, and not, but whatever. It's it's good to me to just right. not be recording with, you know, white Jewish guy who's around 50. So, Oh, yeah. oh God, yes, 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 <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, you know, yes. Too many of us <laughs> at this point. But um, there's actually a, a line when I was doing my research for this, I, I came across a line that I, I want to get your assessment as to whether it's fair or unfair in its description of you. Uh, New York Review of Books piece about you last year said, Gornick has long enjoyed an audience of literary depressives and feminists. Yeah. Fair? Unfair? I, I don't know. I was shocked by it. I, I know I know her, and I forgot to ask her that. I thought... A I literary that's depressive? Quite right. Literary <laughs> depressive. Who does she actually mean? Uh, <laughs> oh, I know. I know what she means now. Uh, I should. I should have asked. I should have asked. It, yeah. was, it was a very odd sentence. She's talking about uh, the all the the men in um, the collection called the men in my life. Mm -hmm. um, they're all depressives. And actually, that book was written. That book was put together. Not written. That book was put together in order to satisfy my own uh, growing. Um, tolerance uh, of men <laughs> it was so funny philip said to me i remember he said you're you're progressing you're progressing you're getting more sympathetic <laughs> actually it really wa was an act of sympathy where and i did choose them all because they were depressives they were all depressive <laughs> and and i sort of was saying when women are depressed they mostly go to bed these guys are depressed and they struggled on through and they kept on working and I admired them all for that. And I put the book together around those sentences. So she picked <laughs> she picked up on that in an odd way. <laughs> right. You know, it, depresses. it was one of those you know, reading a whole lot of your stuff in the past six months, I thought this appeals to me. And I guess that means I'm a literary depressive no, too. No, but, no, you know, and I'm no, fine in no. that respect, but you know. No. Yeah. Uh I'm not a literary depressive. <laughs> My <Yeah>. subjects were. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask, what, what do you feel you've gotten better at, you know, oh. especially in recent decades with writing? I know you, you write. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. I've gotten better at judging my own work. Mm -hmm. I've gotten better, I think, as the years go on. I'm spotting a badly written sentence, spotting um, a bad transition spotting a place and a, i mean i just i think that's that's all that i live for actually yeah. just to get better at that at all that just to make the piece deeper smarter um more effective um yeah i mean if i look back as this book made me look back at 40 years of writing I am pleased to see uh, the improvement that I could respect myself and be happy about. Uh, and uh, there are pieces that I wrote in the last 10 years <clears throat> that I really like a lot. And I think, well, I like them because I think you, you did a good job here. You did what was required. Um, mm. This piece has fashioned exactly how you felt. I hope I have put the reader behind my eyes and made the reader feel what I felt when I was writing about this. 
that's that's what I think I have improved at. <laughs> Look how long yeah. it, uh, it has taken. Um, and that's what I hope. I know a woman who is an extremely accomplished pianist. She's 96 years old, and she practices four or five hours a day. And I said to her a year or two ago, when she was a mere 94, why do you play so much? And she looked at me as if I had sort of lost my wits. And she said, to get better. You know, so that's, I, I, that's... I was talking about the same thing as a cartoonist I recorded with a couple of years ago, um, because that's one of my fields of interest. And he's been doing a daily strip for decades. And his his line work is tighter and tighter and and oh. just you know really exacting. And I said to him, Bill, I always kind of thought as you get older, you get looser, that you're more confident in your own line, you can let it speak for itself. And he's like, Oh no, Gil, it's it's the exact opposite. The the more I work at this, the the tighter and more focused it gets with every passing year. I'm like, that is a very different approach to to art than I expected but that's probably why i'm not accomplished as an artist at all because i keep thinking of when i can yeah. get to the lazy phase but no but yeah, yeah neither one neither one what he has did has done is to discover himself and he has discovered that he needs to get tighter and tighter to get better and better it's not a formula it's not a prescription yeah. there are plenty of people who will get better in the exact opposite way mm. but well who will get less and less tight in the way that's restrictive, that's constricting. Um, it, it's really, it's, it's literally more a matter of becoming yourself. If you have the talent and the drive, which are the least part of accomplishment, necessary but insufficient, as we used to say, um, then you become, if you ha live long enough and are privileged enough to become more and more yourself, then whatever that is, is the way the work, the, that is the way the work should fulfill itself. Um, for some, for him, it's, it's getting tighter. I mean, if the work is better, if it's yeah. more effective. Yeah. Oh, then, trust me. He, he did a week of Edward Hopper homages with his, his character oh, wow. last week. And I just literally, I saw the first one. I'm like, Bill, how much is the original art for that? Because that, that needs to be hanging on my wall. And, and we, took care oh. of that right away. I, I'll, I'll send you a picture of it because it was just this yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous thing. Good. So um, can you tell me, <laughs> living in New York, being part of the literary world, the, do literary friendships survive criticism necessarily? <laughs> or do? <laughs> do uh, and again, I, I think in terms of Philip Roth, uh, but, you know, and, and other, you know, are there writers who you've written about who did not take kindly to, to, to what you wrote or does, does that enter into the relationship um, or, um, or were you someone who kind of avoided literary friendship for know, that reason? You know, there are many, many kinds of worlds of, for writers in New York. Um, mm. There is no single literary world. So there are people and I'm one of them for whom literary friendships do not form uh, the majority of my friendships yeah. by any means. I have discovered, though, over the years, if we don't like each other's work, it's not so much my being criticized as my criticizing. I'm, the, I'm usually the critical factor in a <laughs> relationship. And I do have to say, in those instances in which I've had friends who were writers whose work I did not, um, whose work I did not respect, the friendship fell apart. Um, it's a hard one to take. I myself have never required of any friendship uh, that the friend uh, be my reader. Never. Uh, and I have, I have friends whom I know either don't read me or uh, what I don't, you know, I just don't do it for them. They are not my readers. And the friendship, as far as I know, is not uh, really um, affected by that. I truly do not require that. Um, but others, others uh, I have known whom, whose work did not mean much to me. When they realized this, they they kind of cut you out. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and that's the sort of thing I I, I wondered. Again, yeah. I'm on the outside. I'm in northern New Jersey, 25 miles away. Oh. I, I become friendly 
with yeah. with guests, but I, I'd never want to assume that any of, of my pod guests actually, you know, consider me their friend. Um, but I do wonder about, yeah. you know, sometimes the, the, the critical versus the, yeah, we, we get along, but he's never forgiven me for writing X right. about this book. <laughs> that is true. That is yeah. true. It really mm -hmm. is true. And, uh, and I've been in a position and many others, uh, I've been in a position to meet someone who was critical of my work and I can see myself, um, you know, I run, I run into somebody at a party or an event and they introduce themselves. I recognize the name immediately. And I know 30 years ago, this one said something bad about me. <laughs> <laughs> and I can remember the sentence right there on the spot. <laughs> uh, have you so, ever called it back in front of them or do you just stew about it? And, and no, you know, okay. <laughs> I, I, I used to, when I was younger, I would call it, yeah, and it would be terrible or make things worse. But I don't. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> that's, that's that's a sign of of maturing. I hope and, and, and growing up. So I, I read that you've you've lived in the same home for about thirty or so years. Is yeah. That, okay. Yeah. More. Yeah. So 35, 40, Yeah. When we look at something like unfinished business, how do you keep the books under control? Have you oh. have you had to cull books? You know, how often do you I look do at a book every, and say, "Yeah, go on." I do that every year. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I still feel overrun, but I'm um, nowhere near what other people are. No, I, I, I can't live. Uh, I can't live in a couple of rooms that are just dominated by piles of books. I really can't do that. So every year I go through the books and I, I look at every one of them and I say, are you going to read this again? Or are you ever going to read this period? Or can, or is this a book you just emotionally must have on the shelf or not? If the answers are no, I pull them and I go sell them. And then I let the shelves fill up again. I'm, uh, I'm so glad to hear that because that's exactly, those are the criteria I use. Will I ever get yeah. to this? Will I ever reread this? But it does create the, there's still the, the question or challenge. What about books you were given either by the author or just you know oh, by someone a as a one. gift? Yeah, <laughs> that's a very hard one. And I had had a terrible experience with all with that years ago. It was unjust, but it was apt. Um, I let's see, had, I received a postcard from someone who anonymously I received a postcard from someone anonymously who quoted George Bernard Shaw, who said he walked into a secondhand bookstore, found a book that he had inscribed to someone, right? And he knew who he'd inscribed it to. Yeah. So he bought the book and sent it back to that person <laughs> and re-inscribed it with even greater admiration. <laughs> <laughs> so this person sent me this and then wrote under it, well, I'm I'm cheaper than George Bernard Shaw, so I didn't write the I didn't buy the book. Yeah. Buy the book back. Right? <laughs> Got it? I thought, my God, who on earth is this? And what did I do? Because I, I don't ever remember doing that. However, for many years, I taught in the other parts of the country, and I always sublet my apartment. And often a book would be missing when I'd come home, you know, this or that. And I thought, maybe somebody read that, that book and then sold it. Maybe somebody stole it from my shelf and then sold it. So I didn't know. I realized that's what must have happened. Somebody came across a book inscribed to me, and wrote, and the author wrote this. So a long time passed, at least a year, <laughs> and I didn't know. What. And then one, I, one night I was at a publication party. It was just a big public affair, practically. Mm -hmm. And I ran into a, a writer I knew, whom I hadn't seen in a very long time, a man. Uh, and we enthusiastically started a conversation and the more enthusiastic he grew about my my part of the conversation, I saw him looking uneasy. And finally, he said to me, I'm really sorry about that postcard. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> he said, yes, I found a book that I inscribed to you in a bookstore. And it pissed me off. <laughs> 
I said, I never do that. Never. <laughs> yeah, I was, right, I was, at, you have to hold on to. <laughs> right. Just, just as evidence. Yeah. Yes. I, I was at the strand once and a, I came across a book I had given to a pal of mine because I, I, when I saw it, I was like, Oh, I should pick up another copy of this to give as a gift. And then I realized it was the copy I bought for the pal of mine because it was filled with notes on the back pages about oh, what a terrible book oh it was, and Gil has terrible taste, and and all this. I'm like, now <gasps> I really have to buy it because you know I, I just need to, to have this copy on on hand. So out of circulation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was just a great laugh to, at that point. To, I, I had to, oh, okay, Vince just wrote all this yeah. terrible stuff. I need to, to have it. Then he took the effort to write that in the the back page yeah. notes, and then sold the book. I found absolutely remarkable. But that yeah, I, I I was just like, of all coincidences. Yeah, that, that works <laughs> that out great. Funny. That's what yeah. you get hanging around the Strand, I guess. But Oh, yes, um, definitely. Absolutely, the Strand. Uh, in fact, let me ask, your New York, like, how is the city, it, and it's been your, your home all your life, yes. uh, starting from the Bronx and now, now you know, where you are in the, the, the village. Right. How's New York changed for you over, over, the, you mean, over the course over of your life? Over my life or yeah. over the now, course your, of my life? Yeah. Yeah. How, wh how, what is your New York now? What was your your favorite New York? You know, what's the city meant to you and how's it uh, evolved? Um, my favorite New York, I guess, was, although, well, let me put it this way. In a certain sense, New York never changes for me. And one of the reasons is I never look up. I, I experience the city at eye level at all times. If you look up and you see the wilderness of glass and steel that fills the sky above New York, you could really faint and you could quake. Yeah. But so I don't do that. So in that sense, in the largest sense that New York has changed for so many people, it doesn't really change for me because I experience it at at um, um, at eye level. And in that sense, the city never changes because there's a consistency to crowd life, to to life on the street, to the crowds on the street. No matter what the color, no matter what the class, uh, no matter what, there's a certain level of theatrical eccentricity that works itself out all the time. And that has never changed since I was a girl. The, you know, as I say, the color changes, the sex changes. When I look at photographs of New York, Midtown New York in the 1950s, when I was a very young woman in the 1950s, it's a sea of white men wearing hats. There is no, no one of yeah. color. There's nobody young. There are no women, right? I mean, now, there, of course, there must have been in the actual street. If you walk down the street, if you walk down Fifth Avenue yeah. in the 1950s or 60s, there must have been, but the numbers were so small that a photograph could leave them out completely. Well, that's the biggest change. I mean, then you look at a Woody Allen movie, for instance, and there's <laughs> New York as we know it, you know, or any movie now. But certainly, since Allen did the most to promote that uh, the reality of New York in that way. Although and still, that, without so much, you know, non-white people. But you know, I've I've uh, I'm a big Woody Allen devotee up to a certain point. Um, yeah. which again becomes problematic. So, yeah. The crowd yeah. scenes don't, you don't think they're uh, legitimate? Crowd scenes more, yeah. They, they, they can be more representative, but you know, as far as, as, well, it, it actually, it touches on a question I had from taking a long look, uh, uh, the, the essay on, uh, consciousness raising group. Yeah. Where you, you describe all the, the participants in it. Right. And it, you know, and again, it's coming at it from 2021 perspective, but it's like these the assumption, I guess, is they're all white women, oh, but yeah, we're not even are. saying that. But you know, that's that's yeah. the time back then. Is just there wasn't a, you know, yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. Up until yesterday, uh, if you know yeah. what I mean. Y yeah. Yes, certainly. Um, no, there were yeah, it was they were all white middle class women. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely. Well, the in the nineteen seventies and eighties, the feminist movement was all white and middle class you know, that's it. That's it. That's what it was. Actually, one of the points being white middle-class educated women in America were the freest agents, were the ones who had the most agency over their lives of anyone in the world. And if these women were standing up and saying, I'm a second-class citizen, you had to listen. Yeah. 
that was that wasn't a defense. That was a reality. I mean, that was and it was the most effective reality. It was the truth. Yeah. And it had been the truth uh, 100 years earlier uh, in the 1870s. It was the same truth. And yeah, then sort of, 100 yeah. years later, all those were, were we, too, accused of being um, racist and anti-Semites and this and that. And, you know, all the things that um, an embittered later generation, uh, later generations who can't experience it as as we actually experience it on the ground, um, accuse us of, I mean, I, I know that the second wave uh, feminist today is accused of, of all of those things, yeah. certainly of being racist because it was all white. Uh, so, I mean, I've explained my part of it, of how I see it many times, but I don't defend it anymore. And I mean, it's an accusation I reject. Yeah. Well, there's no way not to reject it. Right. Um, it, it. Again, it's just to me, it's one of those. That's the era, you know. That's that's yes. who this was, it's and it was time. just yeah, yeah. It was Absolutely. just interesting to me. Yeah. In that respect, yeah, we'll get back to New York. But to tackle a narrower oh, question, yeah. how's feminism changed? You know, how do you really see it? I mean, you mentioned the the sense of I don't want to say a historicalness, but you know, that they don't well, necessarily look back at, you know, what you did. And, and even, by the way, you know, when you mentioned the accusations of, of anti-Semitism and, and racism and all that, you also, even in the time, bring up the the splintering of, of yeah. you know, feminism and the way it turned into, you know, a, a sort of repeat of, of the American or the, the Communist Party. Um, yeah, but nothing like today. I yeah. mean, it. Today, it's so bitter and murderous. And um, today, you have political correctness is different from uh, ideological splits. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different number. I mean, what's happening now. Um, and that feels what, what's happening now does not feel like things are opening. It feels like things are closing down. But that's that's from my perspective, which is not that of the ordinary occupant of the current culture. Yeah. <clears throat> I really don't feel like I'm in the culture now. I was going to um, ask, how much do you feel engaged, engaged in that? Uh... No, I don't feel engaged at all. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm engaged, <clears throat> but I am engaged. Otherwise, I wouldn't be writing. Sure. But I'm, 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 those are not my struggles. And, um, and to a large degree, I feel political correctness has us in a stranglehold, uh, and many things horrify me. Um, but these, th this is not the uh, the atmosphere within which I either live by the day or work, or work. I mean, my job now is not to be smart. My job now is to be wise. <laughs> 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 That's my job. <laughs> yep. I'm joking, but I, I, in a certain mm -hmm. sense, I, you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. It's to, yeah, it's these are not my struggles, and feminism. This is how I feel about feminism. Ours was a revolutionary generation. Ours was the one that reawakened America and the world to the struggle for women's rights. Uh, <clears throat> Fifty years after. Uh, the 1920s, when the vote was was won, right? Exactly 50 years later, uh, we started all over again. And for us, it was as if we were reinventing the wheel. It was e every word we wrote, everybody, and every word we spoke, and everything we 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 yelled and screamed about, and every p piece of nasty anarchism we practiced it was as if we were reinventing the wheel, as if we had discovered. And that's exactly how it happens all the time. Um, it was uh, a original passion, rediscovering for the first time what others had discovered many times before. So that was a revolutionary generation. It was visionary. It was philosophical. It was all inclusive. It was the widest kind of thought you could have about the meaning of feminism as a metaphor for the human condition. That's how we saw things. The succeeding generations have not had that. You know, that's the privilege of a revolutionary generation, that you have really such a good time, <laughs> yeah. and that you, which we did, we had such a good time, 
And everyone my age who's alive prizes the memories of those years. What happens then is then it has to be implemented. What we saw then had to be implemented bit by bit by bit at one, one small motion after another, one person after another. Um, that's, that's how social change takes place, right? After that, people had to start living out all the things that we said. If I had a penny for every young, every woman of 40 who approached me when I was, when I was, when we were already 20, 30 years beyond the time I was 40, who said to me, you promised me the world would change and it hasn't changed, you know, Mm -hmm. not enough. I mean, uh, I, my husband still acts as if I'm responsible completely for the how you, when you, you kind of figure out what comes yeah. next, you know, um, and it hasn't changed. I said, we, we didn't promise you change. We promised you, we promised we would open your eyes so that you could live a life of conscious struggle. That's really all that comes after everything we said, because the things we said did not make them come true overnight. We, we, we were talking about was social change, which takes forever. And it only happens person by person by person. Look at all the change that came about over homosexual acceptance. Of a, the acceptance of, I mean, that, that, that is what more remarkable than for us. Because yeah. we yelled and screamed a lot with a lot more bravura than they did. Right. And bit by bit, one by one, as one parent after another had to face the fact that a son or a daughter was gay. That is how the country changed. And look how it did change. It's unbelievable. I I did a podcast with Sandy McClatchy a bunch of years ago where he, he admitted he was embarrassed by, you know, gay marriage, getting acceptance and and gay gay rights, making basically leapfrogging like every other, you know, interest group. He's like, I didn't think it would ever be accepted. And I'm, sort of embarrassed that we jumped over women, African-Americans and everybody else in terms of, you know, the, the degree of, of, you know, advances we made. Cause uh-huh. yeah, Is it that was. How we felt? That he, oh that yeah. They, yeah. Well, well, in a way they're right. Yeah. Well, my question to him was, you know, when you, cause he said he got fired from, I guess it was Yale back uh-huh. in the seventies for teaching essentially a gay literature course without explicitly calling it a gay literature course. I said, did you ever think that that guy from the seventies not only would be able right. to get married to the the partner of his choice, but that the New York Times would cover that on the front page of its Sunday style section. He's like, Gil, you know, <laughs> 78, 88, yeah. 90, even 2008. I didn't think that was, that was right. plausible, but you right. know, it happened. Right. And yeah. yeah, I'm embarrassed exactly. that we kind of, <laughs> that's you know, funny. <laughs> but yeah, that was a, uh, but but look how it happens, and it and indeed it it doesn't happen overnight. It happens over forty years, over fifty years. Yeah. Um, after all, when you when we talk about sexual harassment, for instance, could we have dreamed that forty years ago, forty years later, we would still be in the grip of sexual harassment at the at the level that the twenty seventeen movement uh, exposed? Um, no. On the other hand, there they all were uh, doing the exposing. And it took 40 years for them just to do that. So it's all bewildering and it's all full of of contradictions. But the one thing that's not a contradiction is the amount of time social change uh, takes. So our generation was unusual, not historically, but in terms of, of the lives that we're living now. Ours was the generation that just raised it all over again that, you know, announced uh, w- women are second-class citizens as if for the first time. So all the generations that follow are, are sort of ground down by the fact that they don't have uh, the revolutionary excitement yeah. or energy, um, self-belief. Um, and there's, they are like the grunts of the, of the, the army, you know, you that, know what I mean. that puts me in mind again of unfinished business with that that wonderful chapter you have on on Delmore Schwartz Bellow and once again oh, Philip Roth that yeah. that turns it from why you're not a Jewish American writer you know, why you don't yeah. see yourself as that as opposed to seeing yourself as a feminist writer and and again like the the 
right to, to overpraise the hell out of you the <laughs> you know just the the progress a chapter makes and the way it sort of unfolds those things and then blossoms in the end into you know who you really see yourself you know, where you see yourself fitting in it was just like oh she's in complete control of her prose and has everything you know working to show us this this point um, oh, thank you yeah I, I was just reading it i was like this is great but but at the same time the question of what you bring up the jewish american writer meant something different yeah. and you know now you have to deliberately be holding on to some sort of self estrangement you know to to qualify when you yeah. know it's longer the, the societal uh, yeah. or cultural thing it once meant yeah yeah and it, it in itself um the progress that is made on the part of the jewish american as opposed to the american jew if you see what i mean yeah. That in itself, I mean, the progress of the of 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 the Jewish um, position in America is is a, a great example of how America changed. Now, um, um, of how slowly, of all the particular decades it took for Jews to become assimilated, and after all, when I think about it, mostly I'm thinking about the 1960s and 70s, mm -hmm. and it, it took up like up until yesterday. For suddenly it to seem so um, immaterial to write about your life as a Jew in America, yeah. but not a minute earlier. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, not a minute earlier. I mean, um, yeah, but it, it's a perfect example, um, uh, is all I'm saying of of how it changed, how things change, and how the cha how slow the change is, and how boring all the decades in between <laughs> yeah. really are. That's what these young women are really um, accusing us of, how boring it's all been since we were yelling and screaming. Yeah. And they're and they're angry. Uh, well, well, I mean, they said it all. I don't have to say it for them. They right. said it all. It's mm -hmm. um, it's been too little, way too late, yeah. but not from the point of view of the actual time that social change takes to to grip a country which can only happen or a whole world uh one by one by one that's the mystery of it and that's what's amazing about it um and then all of a sudden one day it's over um uh, but not yet <laughs> not for us <laughs> but for the new york question though your favorite era and, yeah. and I don't oh, know if it's going to be the Fran Lebowitz thing. No, no, it's okay. I, I, my world is all about digression. No. So, you know, oh, but is oh, it the Fran okay. Lebowitz thing with the wherever you are in your 20s is the, the best time or or do you have oh, another? Did, did she say that? Yeah, that, that's one yeah. of her, her catch things is yeah, well, yeah. wherever you are in your 20s is the best place ever because you're in your 20s. But Well, that's um, a good point. Yeah. I was about to say, uh, I'd say the 20 years between 20 and 40 for me. Those 20 years. That would have been 50s uh, to 70s. That would have been, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They were the best, yeah. They were great, yeah. For a young woman in New York, um, my my feelings, I, I once said my definition of New York at its best was when everything was cheap, safe, and free, or free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, when no matter where, no matter how much you were making, you had a, when I think back on myself in the seventies, um, you know, as a young as a young writer at the Village Voice, I mean, I was making nothing. I was making like one hundred seventeen dollars a week, and I could do anything I wanted. Now, of course, it was good that I didn't want anything beyond that one hundred seventeen dollars. Yeah. There was nothing I really wanted. I I I turned out to not have a bourgeois bone in my body. I, I never wanted anything. <laughs> All Just I ever wanted was to be a good writer, <laughs> right? Um, so I, whatever money I had, it was always more. It was always pretty much on, enough. I was living in a very sunny tenement apartment. <laughs> um, I had all the freedom that I wanted. I was doing the work I wanted to do. Um, um, I looked the way I wanted to look. Uh, life was good, and life felt immensely fee free and exciting. and And it was nothing. I was creating it all out of my head. I mean, it was, as I said, I was living at one hundred seventeen dollars in a tenement apartment. But New York was all of those things for me. It, it, I mean, up in well, it's so complicated. New York changed so much. 
But in the years that I was growing up and that I was in college, especially from being in City College, where we roamed all over Manhattan with such freedom and um, didn't really need anything. But again, the city felt safe. Hmm. That was it above all else. It yeah. felt safe. It felt friendly. Um, it felt miraculously open. Um, and that's it. Uh, that is, but she's probably right um, that when you're in your 20s, wherever you are, it's wherever you are. It's the golden age. Yeah. yeah, it is. But New York is um, ever renewing. I mean, it's a city that, that to this day, uh, I walk out in the street and I feel this incredible charge. I just feel this, it's like I, I inhale it. Um, and I take a long walk and I feel exactly what I've always felt. I mean, you just feel this terrific charge. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's the thing I miss most. And I, I, I will ask you about the pandemic in a moment. But oh. for me, whenever I leave my town here in northern New Jersey, we can see the entire New York City skyline like 20 yeah. miles away. And right. did I, you ever I, live in New York? No, no I've, I, this is going to freak you out. But I live in the house I grew up in. Which oh. really, yeah, it's weird uh, to do that. But I've been here most of my life. If it doesn't uh, freak you out. It doesn't freak me out. <laughs> no, I have room for all my books. You know, and I still have oh, to do calls just like you do. But you know, um, but it's this thing when you leave my town, and and you, you know, for the past year especially, I look over the skyline and I'm like, I uh -huh. have no idea when I'll be back there again. But it's killing me that I can't, you know. Go into oh, New really? York and just do something like this. Park up on Ninety Sixth Street, take the the subway down, and and yeah, you know, go record with people. But why? Why can't you? It's just pandemic. Oh, I just pandemic. can't do it. Yeah, it's I just this this past year. The pandemic. Yeah. Oh, well, it's just this past year. <laughs> yeah, well, that was my thing. March March seventh was the last day I came into the city. And I did a, a podcast. I went to the Antiquarian Book Fair. Did a second podcast. Drove home and thought. Things seem weird. I don't know where things are going. I'm glad I got these two yeah. sessions in. And then a few days later, everything went sideways. But yeah. well, let me ask in that respect, you know, where do you want to go? Um, you know, once once we're able to safely go, you know, to, to either restaurants, museums, whatever. Is there a, oh, a thing oh, yeah. you're really pining for? <clears throat> yeah. uh, a movie. A, yeah. a, go to a movie theater. <laughs> Sit down in a movie in a theater full of people. Um, yes, no, the, it's the total absence of ordinary social, socialized cultural life. It's the ordinary absence, uh, the theater, the movies, the music, um, it's, uh, shops of a uh, great variety, uh, restaurants that have closed. I'm waiting for all of those things to come back, whether in their original shape or not. But I know that all the restaurants, for instance, in my neighborhood, which is one of the busiest in the entire city uh, and still filled with thousands of young people crowding into all these makeshift outdoor uh, dining spaces. And nevertheless, the city, the streets feel dead a great deal of the time mm -hmm. and hundreds of shops are closed or boarded up um, and, you know, shops, restaurants, all kinds of places. Um, the city feels dead, even though, New York can never really feel dead because of the millions of people who never stop tramping through the streets. Uh, so that in itself keeps it alive and lively. But in essence, it just feels dark and silent and, um, and so sad, sorrowful. It really does. And it has for a very long time down here, especially down here. So I look forward. And that, that makes me feel like I'm walking around in a fog. Even though I'm not, and uh, I, I, my life has been pretty much lived as it always is. I live alone. I work alone. Uh, none of that changed. Um, the, I mean, none of that, that so-called isolation has not ground me down because it's very familiar to me. Nevertheless, I can't remember what day it is um, mm, yeah. th very often. It feels like it's just one long, undifferentiated piece of time and space stretching out in every direction. Um, so it just, it feels bad. It feels really bad. Um, but I go on truck and like everybody else I know, I do everything I've always done. I, I work, I walk, I read, I talk. And now I, there are a few people, a group of about five of us who 
met, have met every single day for at least an hour uh, oh, since the, the, for the whole year. And now we're all vaccinated and now we all have dinner together. Congratulations. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm in tier infinity plus one. I will not get, uh, no one is going to pick me for vaccination for a long time. I'm oh, that's 50 true. years old and healthy yeah. and everything else. Yeah. But, you know. Well, there you are. <laughs> you know, I, I've got that going for me at least. But Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then we have vaccination going for us. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so I, we I, are all vaccinated. And, um, uh, and I take the subway. I go visit people on the Upper West Side. Um, so, you, you know, I, my niece thinks I'm incredibly reckless and she chastises me for this. But I feel like I'm, I act, I think I'm acting sensibly. I always wear the mask, et cetera, et cetera. You yeah. know? And I never got sick. So, and now I'm vaccinated. Um, yeah, no, I, I would consider yourself, I, I would keep up with the mask, et cetera. But yeah, you're, yeah. you're not otherwise. taking your life in your yeah. hands doing yeah. this. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. But I still take long walks. Yeah. I mean, I still, I walk every day. I used to walk six miles a day. To the, now I walk between two and three miles a day. Mm-hmm. But I do do that. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, there's certainly still um, a significant degree of theatricality in the city uh, that I'm amused every single day. Yeah. And when yeah. you can use the mask as a fashion statement, that, that also means something, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't go that far. <laughs> now, the uh, uh, the question that all writers hate when I ask, um, working on another project? No. Okay, good. Because <laughs> if they are working on something, they hate you know that I, I bring it up because it's going to jinx whatever whatever they they try and describe to me. So uh, no, good. no, I'm writing reviews and essays. Yeah, uh, but I am working. I mean, yeah. I am working. I just, just not as a, a book project. Yeah, I get no. you. And no. the. The last question, which is kind of um, ominous and weird, but there's a line in Fierce Attachments from your mother that says, uh, you're growing old together, you and what frightens you. Yeah. And you're 85, 86 now? Now I'm 85. What frightens you? Oh, me, yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what frightens me is me. Uh <laughs> What frightens me? That's a good question. Um, and do you feel that I, that line of your mother's holds up? I guess. Well, it certainly did hold up for a long time. Uh, mm. Actually, I don't feel frightened. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I don't know if my answer is sufficient, but um, I guess that's pretty much why I have acted as I have throughout the pandemic. Uh, I'm not frightened. I'm not now. Now that you're saying this, you make me yeah. realize. Um, no, I might be many other things, but I'm not frightened. Um, no. Uh, That's good. Yeah, that is good. Yeah, Thank That's you. something You've to look forward to. For me now. <laughs> yes. I, I, I like to treat this this podcast as therapy for one of us at least. Uh-huh. But <laughs> oh, did you really? What you've accomplished something here. <laughs> Awesome. We've had a breakthrough, yeah. Vivian. We just have to we, keep this yes. up every week. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, when the pandemic is over, you come into New York and we'll have lunch, okay? I, I was going to say, originally I, I said I would love to sit down with you and record, but, you know, based on everything you've said, I would love to just go for a walk with you, you know, once oh, we're past okay. all this, just be able to go walk in the city and, and yeah, we'll stop somewhere for lunch too, but, you know, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much for coming on, Vivian. Right. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And that was Vivian Gornick. Her latest book is Taking a Long Look, Essays on Culture, Literature, and Feminism in Our Time. It's from Verso Books, and it's it's fantastic. As are all of Vivian's books that I've been binging on. So I hope you check it out. Make sure you read Fierce Attachments, her her most lauded memoir, because it's an absolute classic. Uh, go check out Unfinished Business, The Situation and the Story, The Odd Woman in the City. I've got a few others, like The End of the Novel of Love, uh, sitting on my shelf here. And as I think I mentioned during the conversation, she's one of those writers I will keep reading after we finished uh, a, a podcast, which 
I say it with some people, but, you know, I never get back to them. She's one of those people I'm going to keep reading on and on. Now, Vivian is so not on social media, does not have a website. Don't even try. Um, but do yourself a favor. Look up her books. Check out some of her essays online. Gornick is G-O-R-N-I-C-K. Look her up and just be glad she's she's still writing such incisive, illuminating prose. And thanks again to Benjamin Taylor and Philip Lopate for unwittingly opening me up to, to Vivian's books. I'm a knucklehead for going this long without them. Now, you can support this podcast uh, by telling other people about it. Uh, you can also send me postcards, letters, emails, uh, however you want to drop me a line. You can leave me a message on my Google Voice number, which is 973 973- Eight six nine nine six five nine, and however you reach out to me, tell me what you like. Tell me what you don't like uh, about the podcast. Uh, who you'd like to hear me record with, or or what movie or TV show or book or music or or whatever piece of culture you think I should turn listeners on to. And if you've got money to spare, then I really hope you'll support individuals and institutions in need. You can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or whatever. Just uh, there are a lot of people out there looking for, you know, some sort of support for their art or for medical bills or, or all the various things people need nowadays. There are also institutions in need, and you can reach out. I always tell people, go through your local food bank, uh, the Poor People's Campaign. There are freedom funds. There are funds about, you know, election fundraising in terms of trying to, to raise voter uh, access and things like that. There are a lot of things you can do and that your money can do to, to help build a better world. So I hope you'll help. And I still have some copies left of the first issue of my very first zine, Haiku for Business Travelers. Uh, if you want one, they're free. Just drop me a line or visit haiku for business and, and hit me up through the little form there. Um, like I say, free. You can kick in a few bucks for postage and production if you want, but it's not a money-making thing. It's just me sharing writing, photography, podcast excerpts, and whatever the hell we call my art. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, Talk it up on social media and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 